Alleluia. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Alleluia. Jesus looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Let us pray. God of majesty and might, your glory shines throughout the universe, from the highest heaven to the deepest sea. In all the creatures you have made, in the seasons that shape our living. Your glory shines through who you are and through what you do. The power of your glory touches your creation and exalts it. To you we offer our worship, to you we offer our praise. Before you we come in adoration. Lord, forgive us when we have been distracted. Help us to give our fears to you. Restore us, support us, strengthen us, establish us. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome to this short act of worship for today, Aldersgate Sunday, a day on which Methodists across the world mark the conversion experience of John Wesley on this date in 1738 and that of his brother Charles just a few days earlier. More about that a little later. Many of you watching will know that I'm Patrick, a Methodist minister in the north and northwest of Bristol and into South Gloucestershire. Whether you're joining from locally or from further afield, the welcome is the same as together we seek, like John and Charles Wesley, to encounter Jesus and to follow his words and understand how to be his disciples in the world today. Before we hear words from the beginning of the book of Acts, there are just three sets of people I want to say thank you to. Firstly, once again, the choir at St Peter's Pilding who have prepared and sung our hymn today. Secondly, I'm pleased to welcome, as it were, Barbara Glasson, the President of the Methodist Conference, who has freely offered some prayers for all of us across the country who are recording and streaming worship at the moment. And thirdly, to Howard Wilson, who reads words from Acts chapter 1. And I invite you to listen and engage with them as he does so. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. The Ascension of Jesus. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers.
For me, there is something quite exciting about following the account of Jesus and his disciples in this period of the Christian year. Starting on Maundy Thursday, when we remember the disciples and Jesus gathering in that upper room, during which he foretold the future, both his own and theirs, by telling them about his death and how they would remember it in the breaking of bread and the blessing of wine, something he commanded them to do in their future. Following that, despite assurances that he'd stand by them, of course it would be Peter who would visibly and poignantly betray Jesus amidst the events of Jesus' trial, demonstrating that even the man that Jesus commissioned to be the leader of his church, to be the rock, the foundation, it would be Peter who would show his fallibility and human weakness as he betrayed Jesus in the middle of that trial. And then the disciples standing alongside the pain and anguish of the cross as Jesus suffered the most tortuous of deaths. And just as the implications and the denial and disbelief of the process of mourning started to sink in, a further moment of disbelief unfolds as the women, the first visitors to Jesus' tomb, return with the news that he's not there, his body has gone, prompting a whole new set of bewildering emotions. And as the disciples open yet another chapter of God's story in Jesus, is it possible that he's not dead, but alive? And as the events unfold, Jesus keeps appearing, teaching them, and then disappearing again, almost by his actions continuing to sow doubt in their minds about what the future holds. But each time he does so, there's a renewed sense of hope, a renewed sense of how their future will pan out, one which they will live out in Jesus' name. It's exciting because through those experiences, God's story in Jesus is shared more widely and more deeply with those disciples as time progresses. And Jesus is getting them for the next step, ready for a different future once again in his name. It's all the more exciting because the things that Jesus came to show the world how to do, to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly, all these things are to be shared with not just the disciples, but with the whole world. And those disciples have a key part to play in that story as it continues to unfold. Our reading tells of the moment when Jesus would stop that process of appearing, teaching and disappearing again. And as we find out, he would be lifted and hidden from their sight, disappearing forever. But before that happens, the disciples are after something definite about their future. But as Jesus answers their question, he reminds them that the Holy Spirit will come upon them, not on him as it did at his baptism, but upon them. You will receive power and will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so the ascension marks a decisive change in the disciples' relationship with God. Because what they should be waiting for is not Jesus' next appearance, but the moment when they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In a week's time we shall mark Pentecost, which with Christian eyes we remember that moment when 50 days after Jesus' resurrection all were gathered in Jerusalem. And all those there would witness the Holy Spirit touching the disciples. In this current hiatus, like those first disciples, we yearn for certainty. We yearn for a future which we can get our head around. We yearn to gather in our sacred places, in one sense, in our Jerusalem. But the current restrictions don't allow us to do so. During the last few days, I came across a short piece of writing which talked about the word hiatus in geological terms. In that sphere, a hiatus is a gap in knowledge which, for whatever reason, can't be explained. But because there's a gap, 
it arises curiosity in the quest for certainty. The piece went on to say that sometimes it's in the pauses, in the gaps, that there is time and space to allow things to grow and develop. You only need to take a glance at the gaps in the stones in the patio at the back of our house to realise that lots of things can grow in the gaps. And in our current hiatus, we have lots of questions because we're yearning for certainty. We're yearning to understand our place in God's future. We're yearning to be in our sacred spaces as we see them in our church buildings. But I hope and pray that we yearn once more to be received and touched and be blessed by the Holy Spirit. And may we allow God's justice and mercy to grow in us, in our gap, in our hiatus, so that we can be witnesses to God's work in us, not just in in our church buildings, but in the sacred spaces we find ourselves in right now, and in the ones we shall find ourselves in in the future, when we are touched once more by the gift of the Holy Spirit, through which we will glorify God. Alleluia! The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Alleluia. And so it's my pleasure to be able to welcome Barbara Glasson to lead us in our prayers. And once Barbara has done so, please join in with the Lord's Prayer in a version of your choice. On the 24th of May, 1738, we hear that John Wesley unwillingly went to attend a meeting of the Moravian Religious Society in Aldersgate Street in London. At that meeting he received an overwhelming assurance of salvation and he knew beyond doubt that he was loved by God and saved by grace. Currently in the UK we are not able to attend church, either willingly or unwillingly. We are isolated in our own homes I make the effort to tune in via Zoom or other means to at least see people, even if we can't be physically present with them. How can we be convinced of God's love and grace in these strange times? There are so many disadvantages of being socially isolated, not least for those of us who are struggling anyway. But one advantage might be that we can pray. One of the most wonderful things about a year as Methodist Presidents is the tangible sense of people praying and supporting me through your discipline of prayer. I thank you and God for this. But this is not just true of Presidents. So I pray that in these strange days we will continue to pray for each other, not just the people we know and miss so much, but also those in other countries around the world who are part of our great Methodist family. This is a prayer I have written to be used at Wesley's Chapel today, and I'd like to share it with you too. Creator of light, we pray this day for anyone whose life is dark, who cannot see the way ahead or is afraid or confused. Shine the lantern of your love into our hearts so that we may discern your truth and follow your way. God of holiness and grace, hear our prayer. Jesus the Word, we pray this day for anyone who cannot speak either because of fear or because they cannot find the words. Write the hope of your love onto our hearts so that we can hear your word and follow your way. God of holiness and grace, hear our prayer. Spirit of life, we pray this day for all who are mentally or physically unwell, either because of the coronavirus or because life is too challenging and confusing Bring your gentle healing into our lives so that we can be revived and live well and follow your way. God of holiness and grace, 
hear our prayer. Creator, Son and Spirit, Holy God, as John Wesley had a ministry bringing health and light and the word of God to all he met, we pray this day for all the Methodist people across the world that we might be active in bringing wisdom, hope and healing so that we and all the earth will flourish and be restored to new life. By your abundant mercy, we pray. God of holiness and grace, hear our prayer. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. And after our blessing, please join in with our hymn either by singing along to the words in front of you or by just listening to the words and the music and allowing God to speak to you as you do so. And so let us pray. Send us out towards Pentecost, waiting for your spirit, looking for signs of your life in ourselves and our communities. Restore, support, strengthen and establish us afresh, today and in the days to come. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Alleluia. Rejoice in the 